Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome again to another ATP video. If you still remember from our previous videos, we talked about parasites. We focused mainly on protozoa in that video. Today inshallah we will talk about another category related to parasites, which is helminths. Just to visit the concept again, parasites can be categorized into two main groups, protozoa and helminths. Previously we talked about protozoa, and today we'll be talking about the helminths. Generally speaking, we can divide helminths into two big groups, platyhelminths, which are also known as flatworms, and nematodes, which are known as roundworms. Platyhelminths can be further subdivided into cestodes, which are known as tapeworms, and trematodes, which are known as flukes. One way I like to think about them, to better remember them, is that your plate has cysts and trees. Plate for platyhelminths, cysts for cystodes, trees for trematodes. Weird and gross, I know, but it helps. In this video, we will focus on the platyhelminths, and we'll leave the nematodes for another video, inshallah. Going back to our classification, under the first category, we have cystodes, or tapeworms, if you wish. We will talk about Tinisolium, Diphilobothrium latum, and Echnococcus granulosus. Whereas for trematodes, or flukes, we will talk about Schistosoma and Clonorchus sinensis. Please keep in mind that these two categories do not only include the species that we just mentioned, but these are the ones that we think are commonly tested in board examinations. Starting off with the cystodes, they're also called tapeworms. And the first tapeworm we will be talking about is Teneosolium. Teneosolium is usually transmitted to humans from consumption of either larvae or eggs. Ingestion of larvae can lead to intestinal type of disease. And this usually comes from eating undercooked pork, leading to GI symptoms such as nausea and abdominal pain. On the other hand, ingestion of eggs from food contaminated with the human's feces, for example, can lead to cystocercosis. Symptoms of cystocercosis may vary, and they depend on the location of tissue infected and the number of larvae. It can affect skeletal muscle, heart, skin, liver, lung, or other tissues. It can also reach the brain to cause neurocystocercosis, leading to serious neurological and epileptic complications. Another tinea we can talk about is tinea saginata. The important differences between both Tinea solium and Tinea saginata is that the intermediate host is cattle, unlike solium, which is swine. It does not have a hook in the scolex, which is the anterior portion of the worm, and unlike Tinea solium, Tinea saginata does not cause cystocercosis. For the treatment of intestinal and cystocercosis caused by Tinea solium, we use praziquantel, whereas for neurocystocercosis, we use albendazole. Next worm on the list is Diphilobothrium latum. Diphilobothrium latum is also called fish tapeworm, and it's the largest tapeworm out there. Upon ingestion of larvae in raw freshwater fish, it resides in the GI tract, causing many GI symptoms such as diarrhea, and it can also cause vitamin B12, cobalamin, deficiency, leading to megaloblastic anemia. As for the treatment, we also use praziquantel. So even though it's the largest tapeworm, there is little to know about it. The last tapeworm we're going to talk about is Echnococcus granulosus. Echnococcus granulosus is transmitted to us humans by the ingestion of eggs in food that is contaminated with dog feces. It's also nice to know that sheep are intermediate hosts. Echnococcus granulosus can lead to the formation of hydatid cysts in the liver, which are described to have eggshell calcification and it's usually detected on CT scan. It's worth mentioning that the contents of the cyst can lead to anaphylaxis if the cyst ruptures for whatever reason. For the treatment of Echnococcus granulosus, we use albendazole. Next, we're going to talk about trematodes, or flukes. We'll be talking about schistosoma and Clonorchus sinensis. Starting with schistosoma, it's important to differentiate between three species of schistosoma, which are schistosoma mansoni, Schistosoma hematobium, and Schistosoma japonicum. We use their eggs to differentiate between them. So, Schistosoma mansoni egg has a lateral spine, whereas Schistosoma hematobium has a terminal one. And lastly, japonicum does not have a spine. For Schistosoma transmission, 
It's transmitted when the cercaria penetrate bare skin in fresh water, for example, when swimming in a contaminated water. Also, it's worth to mention that the intermediate hosts for schistosoma are snails. Now, for the clinical significance, just try to remember this. Schistosoma mansoni and duponicum affect the GI tract, causing intestinal schistosomiasis, while schistosoma hematobium affects the urogenital tract, leading to urinary schistosomiasis. Schistosoma mansoni can also cause liver and spleen enlargement, fibrosis, inflammation, and portal hypertension. So they're all related to the GI tract. On the other hand, schistosoma hematobium can cause squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. In addition, it can cause pulmonary hypertension compared to portal hypertension in mansoni. Now for the treatment, we can also use praziquantel to fight these worms. The last worm we're going to talk about today is Clonorchis sinensis. The name looks a bit scary, and so does the cactor, but don't worry, it's easy to remember. It's transmitted by consuming undercooked fish, and once this happens, it can lead to biliary tract inflammation and consequently pigmented gallstones. It's also associated with cholangiocarcinoma, or cancer of the biliary tract. Lastly, for the treatment, can you guess what drug we use? You're right, it's praziquanto. Okay, to summarize again, here's the classification of parasites. We talked previously about protozoa. Today, we started talking about helminths, and we divided them into two groups, platyhelminths and nematodes. Platyhelminths were as the target of today's video, and they were further divided into two subgroups, cestodes and trematodes. In the next video, we will talk about the nematodes. Finally, we hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know what you like or dislike about our videos in general, and about this video in specific, so we can improve in the next videos. We truly appreciate all your feedback, and rest assured that we do our best to work on the suggestions that you guys are giving us. Don't forget to like and subscribe to receive our latest explanations. And as always, thanks for watching.